salt coats. Where they once boiled seawater to make salt. Hence the name. Although I suspect sometimes in pronunciation the T is dropped and you would never think that the word salt was in there. It's a fascinating part of Ayrshire, absolutely packed full of history. Of course, to boil seawater you needed coal. And from the late 17th century, the area around Salcoats and nearby Stevenson blossomed with coal pits and salt works and even a new harbour to allow some of that excess coal to be exported to Ireland. But then with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution, even more industry appeared in this area. Everything from iron works to chemical works and even the world's largest explosives factory just a few miles east of here on the Ardeer Peninsula. Where does our dear village come into all this? And can we even call it a village? Given that it was just a, a whole load of uh, rows of cottages arranged in, in a rectangular shape around a large reservoir and called Ardeer Square. It was not part of Stevenson. It sat in isolation beside a large ironworks and was without question a village in its own right, complete with a pub, a shop, a reading room, later to become a mission hall. Today there's absolutely nothing left of that village. No village or village square, no ironworks and no explosives factory. And the big question is, what on earth happened to our dear? In order to make it easier to move coal from a number of mines in the area, Robert Reed Cunningham built a canal in 1772, probably the first canal ever worked in Scotland, but it was a fairly crude waterway, perhaps little more than an elaborate ditch, and had fell out of use by around the 1830s. The canal is quite clearly shown on an old map dating to 1775, along with a house bearing the name Canal Bank. It's practically impossible to see any remaining parts today, but its route, and that of its branches to various coal pits, is echoed in names like Canal Street, Canal View and Canal Cottage in late Victorian maps, and in the Canal Street, Canal View, Canal Crescent and Canal Place that exist today between Salcoats and Stevenston.
Well, this uh, ruin uh, was once an engine house that uh, contained a beam engine that was used to pump water out of a coal mine here. Uh, there were a few mines in the area. I think this engine house was in operation probably from the beginning of the 18th century. You can see this engine house in the first edition order and survey marked date to 1855 and you can also see that at that stage it, it is uh, noted as being a ruin and obviously no longer used then. Um, but what you can also see in that uh, map is um, locations like Canal Bank and Canal Cottage and you can also see a narrow tree line strip that sat just a little south of this ruin and I think in all probability that tree line strip gives you a pretty good idea of the exact uh, route or location of this section of that old canal uh, and that really just just behind the camera there running in that direction as I said earlier practically no sign of it now remains Amidst all this industry, the village of Ardeer appeared. The Glengarnock Iron Company, owned by Messrs Mary and Cunningham, built an ironworks around 1850, and a year or two later constructed a village to provide a workforce for the ironworks. This 1856 map shows the location of Saltcoats, Stevenson and Ardeer Square, or village, by the ironworks. It's not hard to see how isolated the village was in relation to surrounding towns. This earlier map of 1828, before the ironworks and village were built, shows the whole Ardeer Peninsula and alone chemical or magnesia works. As was usually the case back then, Rows of housing could be thrown up very close to coal mines or other factories, and they weren't always well constructed, the houses often lacking life's basic essentials like running water. This is Chemical Row, around the start of the 20th century, close to the ironworks, but not part of Ardeer Square. You can see that although looking like normal well-built housing, the stonework is not well shaped, and they did not even have a slate roof or roof guttering to deal with rainwater. Messrs Merry and Cunningham pretty much owned everything in the area the ironworks, coal mines, and the village of Ardeer. It probably took a few years for the square of houses to be fully occupied. The census returns of 1851 don't mention it. By the 1861 census, some of the houses are occupied and we can see men employed in either the ironworks or coal mines. The houses varied in size and in some they lived a husband and wife with their children and even some lodgers. Some properties housed as many as 12 people which must surely have been overcrowded. By the 1881 census, the whole square, or village, is clearly fully occupied. At number 128 Ardeer Square, for example, lived William Wright, a blacksmith at the Iron Works, with his wife. The census tells us that a number of families lived at one street number, which perhaps makes you think of a tenement with more than one main door. But I'm just not sure about that, as I thought all the rows of housing were at ground level. Nevertheless, also at number 128 was Robert Garland, an assistant furnace keeper at the ironworks, with his wife and three children. The census returns also reveal that some people who lived in the square were now working in a new explosives factory, opened in 1871. Like Robert McCaig at 104 Ardeer Square, who was a dynamite labourer from Ireland. And David Welsh at 102 Ardeer Square, 
who was also a dynamite labourer from Ireland. Quite a few employees at both the ironworks, coal mines and the explosives factory were born in either Ireland or Poland. As Ireland is just across the water from Salkots, it's really not surprising. The explosives works at Ardeer occupied a good part of the Ardeer Peninsula to the east of the village in the ironworks. This was the UK's first dynamite factory, created by Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite and creator of the Nobel Peace Prize, and the largest explosives factory in the world. It later became ICI and employed up to 13,000 people in surrounding towns like Ardrossan, Salcotts, Stevenson, Irvine and Colwinning. Its closure in the 1990s was a major blow to the area, resulting in mass unemployment. But what became of our dear village? The explosives works didn't really have an impact on the survival of Ardeer Square and the adjacent ironworks, although it couldn't have been a lot of fun living beside such a large explosives factory with street names like Dynamite Road. Many sections and buildings in the works were surrounded by high earth or sand banks in order to contain any accidental explosion, of which there were quite a few. This 1947 aerial photo shows the extent of the explosives works and the many banks constructed to contain any accidental explosion. There were many accidents over the years, each resulting in deaths and injuries to the workforce. The inhabitants of Ardeer village must have been very wary of living so near such a dangerous thing. In 1884, for example, there was an explosion that killed six young women, one of whom, Martha McAllister, lived in Ardeer Square. Another massive explosion in 1913 killed seven men and injured eight at the factory. The blast was so powerful that windows were shattered in houses in Irvine, and the sound of the explosion was heard as far away as Muffet. Just one year later, another accident took place, resulting in a huge explosion that blew in shop windows in nearby Stevenson and killed eight men at the factory. There were other accidental explosions resulting in loss of life. Ardeer Square must have been a scary place to live. Some of the people who either worked at the explosives factory or were killed during the many disasters are buried in cemeteries in and around Stevenson. Mary and Cunningham owned many coal mines, ironworks and other businesses throughout Scotland. In Ayrshire, Lanarkshire, Renfrewshire, from Irvine to Motherwell, Coatbridge to Kilmarnock, Maryhill to Wishaw, Renfrew to Airdrie, Dreghorn to Duntoker, Hamilton, Bothwell, Beath, Stevenson, Paisley, Cambuslang, Blantyre, Dulry, etc. These men had the lives of tens of thousands of workers in the coal mining and iron founding industries in their hands. Mary and Cunningham went into liquidation in 1931. And the very big question is, why? Well, as given in an article titled The Raws by John Miller, a decline in the coal and iron industries between the two world wars saw the closure of many coal mines and other works. It's hard for me to fully understand the picture as to why coal mining declined in the 1920s. It may have been down to a combination of factors, like the end of government subsidies in 1926, smaller mines being unable to compete with the greatly mechanised output from larger mines, and the fact that there was now an economic slump 
following a period of increased manufacturing during the Great War. Some coal seams may also simply have run out of good quality coal for use in the iron industry. The last coal mine at Deer, in the Stevenson area, closed in 1926. A few years later, the ironworks also closed. It was demolished in 1934. Ardeer Square was no longer required. It was owned by Mary and Cunningham. The bulk of employment, whether in coal pits or the ironworks, for all its residents, had gone. And apart from anything, the housing was in most cases no longer fit for habitation. It had been thrown up, like most miners' rows, with little thought to longevity, and in 1946 was demolished. You can see an echo of its rectangular layout in current streets, like Misk Nows and Ardo Crescent. This is the only photo I've been able to find of our dear village. It was taken from the air in 1927, around the time when things were starting to go pear-shaped but you can clearly see the rectangular arrangement of the rows, along with the large reservoir at its centre. You can also see the extent of the ironworks. This aerial photo was taken just 20 years later, in 1947, one year after the village was demolished. You can see the rectangular outline of the village, and all the empty land where the ironworks once stood. Today there is absolutely nothing left of our dear village, and more modern housing occupies the site complete with mod cons like running water, indoor toilets and proper roofs. But I suspect what they don't have are just as many employment opportunities in the area compared to back then. And like Scotland's lost coal mining industry and the many other industries that we've lost over the years, it must have been a blast while it lasted. I'm Eddie Burns. Take care.